Uh, all right, just a reminder, um, if you could please mute yourself, if you are watching this webinar, we will be um, getting started here. It is the top of the hour, depending on what time zone you're in. We are here at one o'clock in the afternoon on the East Coast, but we've got participants here from as far away as Germany. So we are covering the globe. Thank you all. I'm Eleni Tsigis. I'm the CEO of the Preeclampsia Foundation and welcome to another episode of Beyond the Headlines. We do these periodically as a way to get uh, a chance to talk directly with the researchers or the newsmakers in the media who are behind some of the biggest stories happening in preeclampsia. Um, this is, I think, about the third one that we've done, looking more intently at some of the new research that's coming out. Um, today we have with us three esteemed guests who are going to be talking about a new preeclampsia assessment tool that has been developed by Thermo Fisher Scientific, which was recently approved by the Food and Drug Administration for use here in the U.S. Yeah. Um, this presentation is being recorded and we will have time for Q&A at the end. I would like to do a quick introduction of our speakers and just know that we are going to be putting um, a slightly longer bio in the chat feature so you can read more about them. I also want to mention um, in the interest of transparency, we've asked all our speakers to disclose any financial interests that they may have, and we're also posting those in the chat. It is fairly standard practice for any diagnostic company to call upon the brightest academic and clinical minds to help test their product and to um, provide uh, consultation on what they're developing, and our speaker certainly represents oh, the most. So our speakers definitely represent some of the brightest clinical and scientific minds and critical mm. thinkers about preeclampsia biomarkers. So we're eager to to get started. Um, starting with Dr. Sarosh Rana, she is a director, uh, professor of obstetrics and gynecology and the section chief of maternal fetal medicine at the University of Chicago Medicine. She's also the co-chair of our preeclampsia registry advisory council and serves on our medical advisory board here at the preeclampsia foundation. Along with her experience as a clinician, She's a prolific researcher in preeclampsia and even more specifically in biomarkers and was one of the leading authors of the paper, Circulating Angiogenic Factor Levels in Hypertensive Disorders of Pregnancy, which is a very important study that helped to validate results here in the US, uh, in a US patient population. Kind of uh, switching over to one of our the other authors of that paper, Dr. Ravi Fandani is the Executive Vice President for Health Affairs uh, at Emory University. He's the Executive Director of Emory's Woodruff Health Sciences Center and Vice Chair of Emory Healthcare Board of Directors, where he oversees their renowned academic health sciences enterprise, focusing on advancing research, training, and healthcare delivery innovation. He's had over 30 years of experience as a researcher himself and an internal medicine physician. And like Dr. Rana is one of the authors of one of many seminal papers on biomarkers, but the one that helped validate data here in the US. He's also been a dear friend to the Preeclampsia Foundation for years. And I find it um, quite poignant that he helped to uh, moderate our biomarkers consortium that we held many years ago. Gosh, it's been over a decade, so it's especially fitting that you're here with us today, Dr. Sandani. And lastly, we're bringing to you uh, Dr. Stefan Verlochen, who is a researcher, clinician, and professor of OB of obstetrics and a consultant in obstetrics and maternal fetal medicine um, in Berlin, Germany. So he is um, he's published extensively on the use of SLIT and PLGF biomarkers to predict preeclampsia, which is um, what we'll be talking about today. Moreover, I think what's super critical and why we've asked him to join this conversation is because these biomarkers have been used for years already in Germany and in Europe. So he brings professional experience from how he has actually used these in practice. So to all of you, I thank you very much for joining us today. I welcome you and, uh, and let's dive into this topic today. 
Um, starting with you, Dr. Thadani, I'm going to ask you to just talk a little bit about the concept. I mean, biomarkers is a word that we throw around a lot, but it can be a little intimidating for a, a non-clinical or a non-research audience. Can you tell us in uh, terms that we might understand what are we talking about when we talk about biomarker tests, particularly for preeclampsia? And when we talk about these tests and their potential value in predicting or diagnosing preeclampsia, does it predict in any way how the baby is going to do? Elena, let me just first start by thanking you for your advocacy. As you said, right, years ago, you, thanks to the Preeclampsia Foundation and your leadership, decided that biomarkers was critical to this population. And you had enforced us as academicians, as clinicians, as caregivers to say, what can we do better for this patient population that necessarily has not had the attention that it deserves. And really as a result of you and the other scientists on this call, I think uh, we're here today. So I just wanna make sure people realize that. Um, Dr. Rana and Dr. Valoran have been leaders in this space and it's just an honor to be with them. Melania, biomarker just simply put as a biological measure that tells us about a condition or a disease. And ideally the biomarker helps us predict or diagnose the condition or even tells us what's gonna happen after somebody has an illness. A very important feature of a biomarker, which we, my colleague Anand Karamanchi and I, uh, were keen to understand is using this biomarker or could we use this biomarker to tell us about treatment? Because while it's important to diagnose this condition and predict it, ultimately what we'd like to do is make sure we develop a treatment for this condition. And therefore the biomarker might tell us who to treat, when to treat, how much to treat, and hence the importance of a biomarker on many different levels. These biomarkers that we've been looking at um, date back to over 20 years ago, as we were just talking about with Professor Valoran just a few minutes ago. There are two proteins, soluble FLT, uh, FLT1, and placental growth factor, or PLGF. We typically look at both of them together as a ratio, one over the other, and hence the higher the number, the higher the levels of soluble FLT, the lower the levels of PLGF characterize preeclampsia. But it's important to highlight that these proteins are normal proteins made by the placenta, a healthy placenta. And it's really the excess of one as soluble FLT going up and a reduction in the other that really characterize preeclampsia. And what's really interesting about these markers, Eleni, is they are very specific for preeclampsia. In other words, women during pregnancy can have other medical complications, diabetes, lupus, and so forth. And these markers are rather specific uh, for preeclampsia, which makes them, I think, really important in terms of uh, this space. Um, maybe in the last minute or so, just to say, right, when we think of an ideal biomarker for a disease, it's important to ask, what are those features that make biomarkers kind of ideal, right? That they're, the, they're specific for the disease, right? So they're specific for preeclampsia in this case. Um, that there's a dose response. That is, the worse the markers are, in this case, the higher the ratio, the worse the outcomes. Uh, ideally, the biomarker uh, antedates the condition. When a woman comes in for prenatal care, she gets her blood pressure checked and the proteinuria checked. If those are abnormal, that's the disease. These markers, interestingly enough, antedate those clinical signs and symptoms. And also, of course, an ideal biomarker helps us guide uh, treatment. So, we're excited about these biomarkers. Um, the biomarkers are specific for the disease, as I mentioned. But to your last question, which is, can they tell us about outcomes, not just for the mother, but for the baby as well? And I think as you'll see when we talk about the paper uh, and other people have written about this, that they tell us about the outcome of a woman going from preeclampsia to severe disease. They tell us about maternal adverse events they tell us about fetal adverse events. And really interestingly, they tell us about the time between when these levels are measured to when she delivers, meaning it tells us the duration of pregnancy. So it has an, an built in quite a bit of information. And, and certainly the people on this call are experts in this area as well. And interestingly that you said um, that the time between the time that the test is done and when she delivers, which presumably would be an indication of when she should be delivered, when things are really going to get bad for her. Let's actually um, jump over to you, Dr. Ferlohan, to talk about um, how this is actually played out in practice. 
As we mentioned in the introduction, these tests were introduced in Europe um, a few years ago. Can you take us kind of through a before and after scenario? How did you predict and diagnose preeclampsia before the tests were available? And what are you doing now? Thank you, Eleni, for the question. And also um, from my side, thank you for including me in this um, great event here. I think it's First of all, very, very good news for the patients in the US that these biomarkers are now finally available. And it's very important to, to spread the news, to spread the word. So um, indeed, the um, approval by the European regulatory authorities for these biomarkers were, was in 2009. So for 14 years now, we, we have them in our clinical practice. And of course, in the beginning, it was um, a period when uh, you know they needed uh, to be um, um, used, uh, and they were used just a little, uh, you know, a little bit. But the use increased very rapidly. So this is probably what you will see also in the U.S. But the before and after scenario um, is reflected by the uh, disease itself, and we know that preeclampsia can present very unspecific. There are unspecific signs and symptoms. One woman can present with a new onset of hypertension, and that is maybe all. The other woman maybe has a history of HELP syndrome in her previous pregnancy, and now in the next pregnancy has again some upper right quadrant abdominal pain, maybe even some elevation of AST and ALT. And of course, most of all, she is very worried because she will recall the terrible experience she had in her first pregnancy. And maybe another woman um, has just some, some headaches and not even an elevation of blood pressure, but maybe some traces of proteinuria. So in all these very unspecific signs and symptoms, we as clinicians need to rule in or rule out the disease. And rule in and rule out means that we try to identify the women that will progress to severe disease. And as a consequence, hospitalize this woman and if we identify a woman as not being at severe risk and these unspecific symptoms, maybe just uh, another expression of other pregnancy-related problems she has. I mean, she can has a, have um, a headache for other reasons. We, we might send her home. So before the biomarkers, all was related to clinical experience and to the standard clinical tests that we may have, measuring the blood pressure, doing the health lab, and trying then to um guess if you will or to make a best estimate which woman will progress to severe disease and um which not and the research um started by uh, the lab of um anand karamanchi and rafi tadana tadani showed very clearly that the s flip plgf ratio can bring in more light in exactly that point of decision because the very early studies showed and these Results were repeated in a lot of clinical studies for a lot of marker test systems in a lot of patient populations around the globe that the s flip PLGF ratio is the most precise parameter to detect these women who will progress for severe, to, to severe syndromes when they present at high risk of the disease. So when we um, started after the first works, um, from the, the Karamanchi and Tadani lab, and then also work that I was involved in, where we um, looked at um, biomarkers for clinical use. When these first data was there and CE approval was granted, we had our hands on the test. So we were one of the um, first university hospitals uh, in Germany and Europe that actually had these for their patients. And we very suddenly um, saw the benefit of it because when the s plgf ratio was elevated, we knew, and this is what um, Professor Dalani had, has previously said, that first of all, the risk for adverse events is higher and the remaining pregnancy duration was reduced. So these women, we would hospitalize. And other women who also presented with this unspecific presentation, but had a very low ratio, we were then more brave and said, okay, maybe you can stay home with your family because it is not as likely um, that you will progress to severe disease as if the ratio would be higher. And then the most striking effect was seen. A lot of especially older consultants, older um, clinicians had a high resistance to this marks that, oh, I can diagnose a preeclampsia based on my experience. But after a while, when we used these markers in our clinical routine, 
they suddenly then also asked for the ratio result to include it in their clinical decision making. So this is where we are now. Our preeclampsia workup would not be possible anymore without the s to PLGF ratio. It's now an integral part of our, um, yeah, of, of our clinical workup in patients that present at high risk for the disease. So it sounds like what, what it's really done is augmented your toolbox. It certainly hasn't replaced uh, tools that were in there, but it added to it. So and that's, that's a very important to mention, exactly, because that's that's a very important point. It is another tool in the toolbox, but it's not replacing anything. Right, right. Might be a more precise tool. So on that note, um, Dr. Rhonda, let's talk about this practice in the US. Obviously, we have not had these markers other than in sites that perhaps have been uh, involved in some of the research studies. So they've been used in a in a research capacity. But you practice here in the US, all your entire career has been practiced here in the US. How would this test compare to our current standards of care? And not even just necessarily your standards of care, but what you see happening amongst colleagues around the country. And in what situations here in the US could this test be more helpful? Yeah, so thank you, Eleni, so much. And I would like to echo what um, Dr. Tadani was saying. Thank you for all the leadership. I know it takes a lot of effort to do this, but I think you constantly bring all of us back to what it's all about. And really, it's all about patient care. Um, so thank you for inviting me for this webinar. And I'm really um, very um, happy that I'm here with my other esteemed colleagues. So as um, you know, Stefan was pointing out, so everybody here, I think, are mostly obstetricians or in some capacity providers or patients. We know that preeclampsia currently, the way it's diagnosed uh, uh, based on ACOG criteria or whatever criteria you use, are very non-specific signs and symptoms. So essentially, we diagnose preeclampsia sometimes based on worsening hypertension in patients who have chronic hypertension. That's very non-specific. It could just be worsening chronic hypertension, headache. Some of these things are very, very not really disease-specific to preeclampsia. So I think having a biomarker that is not only, and I want to like kind of perhaps it came out earlier, but this is not a biomarker that's just a bystander. I think having a biomarker that is closely linked to the pathogenesis of disease, and then also that's altered early in the disease. So for example, there is also data above and beyond the PRACE study that the this biomarker test will be more abnormal earlier before the patient will obviously have abnormalities and LFTs and perhaps thrombocytopenia. So I think just kind of having that sense is, is very, very good. So I would say that the standard of care, at least in the US, and, and I know, Stefan, we talk about it all the time. You're lucky that you have had these biomarkers for several years. I would say it's not sufficient. And when I say it's not sufficient, it is the clinical criteria that we are given, the presence of hypertension and or proteinuria, quite wow. poor predictors of adverse outcomes and poor predictors of development of severe preeclampsia. So obviously, the data from PRACES, I think we're going to talk about it more from the study that we're talking about. It clearly shows that the biomarker assessment is a better predictor for severe preeclampsia and also better predictor of adverse maternal and fetal outcomes related to hypertension and related to severe preeclampsia above and beyond all available current clinical tests. So the intended use for everybody to just, I'm, I'm going to say this, is for gestational age, 23 weeks and 35 weeks. So that's where we are going to use them among admitted patients. So slightly different version than that what Stefan and other people around the globe are using it. It's really approved for admitted patients or patients who are already hospitalized with either patients who have already have a hypertensive disorder of pregnancy or are strong suspicion of preeclampsia, but are hospitalized for that. And really it is a, and we'll talk, I think with your next question, this is a really prognostic test for risk stratification. So we are trying to figure out who are the people who are at high risk to have these adverse outcomes and who are the people who are at low risk to have adverse outcomes. And in general, I think all of obstetrics, I want to say, is about risk stratification, right? So we are currently using the sign and symptoms. And like you were saying, I think it's a tool which is uh, in the research studies, in large studies across the globe have been shown to have better tool for predicting some of these adverse outcomes. So I think these biomarkers are really the first major step in US to really help all our obstetricians and our clinical colleagues here to identify group of patients who are at high risk to have adverse outcomes and differentiating them from patients who are at low risk for adverse outcomes. And obviously we can talk about what to do with these two subgroups, but really paying closer attention um, in people who are at high risk and perhaps 
providing, obviously providing appropriate care, but also perhaps reducing some of that iatrogenic prematurity that comes uh, with this strong suspicion or with, uh, you know, uh, uh, with the concern for developing severe preeclampsia. So let's, let's actually take this down really to the basic level. Like imagine a patient is asking a question about this test. So let's start with a couple of basics. How is this test uh, done? Is this a blood test? Is this like you spit in a cup? Like how does the test itself get done? Yeah, yeah, it's a blood test. So it is uh, same as what you do when you go to your doctor's office and or if you're in a hospital and you go in and you have some hypertension, you're in triage or you're in the hospital, um, the you know you will be getting a blood test. So it's literally the same tube. It's a serum tube that you're checking for. Currently, we check for hemoglobin when somebody comes in. That's a blood test. We check for platelet count. We check for liver enzymes. It's a similar blood test. It's also done very... Um, quickly so the machine can actually get the result very quickly. And obviously we have to see when it gets implemented in US hospitals, what will be the term turnaround time, but the test itself does not take many minutes. I think it's about 20 minutes that the test can be done. So it's very appropriately can be integrated into your current panel of blood tests that you're already doing to evaluate these patients with preeclampsia. So yeah, it's a blood test. Okay. And then going back, you you made you you used a word that that a lot of our patient population may not be familiar with, but it refers to the fact that sometimes we deliver babies that didn't need to be delivered, and that's one of the things that I think is intriguing when we talk about using this test. As much as we absolutely want to know what mom is going to crash and burn really quickly, we also want to know which ones don't, and that's what I think you were getting at when you were talking about a negative test means that we don't necessarily need to deliver the baby. The baby's going to be okay. And we don't want to deliver babies earlier than we need to. So yeah. that's, that's if we get negative results. Talk a little bit. I mean, by no means am I suggesting that what you're going to say is the prescription for all doctors to follow. But if the test comes back positive, what are some of the things that a patient might experience with her care provider at that point? Yeah, so uh, thank you for asking that question. Let me yeah, break it down really in simple terms as to how, for example, you, we would envision using it. So like I said, it's a, it's a test for risk stratification. And when we say risk stratification, it's really, for now, there is one cutoff that was published in this paper that's approved. That's a cutoff of the ratio of these two proteins and it's a number 40. So if you're lower than 40, you are at low risk. If you're higher than 40, it's a high risk. And Stefan can perhaps talk later about the different cutoffs, but for currently, it's a single cutoff that has been approved. So let me tell you exactly how perhaps we can envision it's being used. So patients, let me go to the low risk patient population first. So for example, if the patient is at low risk, what we would suggest, and again, there are really no clinical protocols right now in US, but this I'm just talking about this just as a pure clinician, and this is what I would plan to do. I would follow these patients based on ACOG criteria and continue their pregnancy. So the holy grail of management of preeclampsia really lies between making sure that the mother is safe and in preterm gestational ages, making sure that you can prolong the pregnancy because prolonging the pregnancy will be detrimental to mom's health. But to a certain extent, when you can say that this mom's risk is low, I can perhaps prolong the pregnancy to beyond wherever you found the patient. So what will this reassure, what will this help us with? Well, it'll be helpful because we can reassure the patient and her family that her risk to develop severe adverse outcomes or risk to develop severe preeclampsia is low. I think that will help reduce some of this anxiety that some of these patients have. I think we can envision that can even reduce the number of days in the hospital. We can perhaps have timely use of betamethasone. We can potentially like the last point is we can potentially, and again, there is like obviously data to be generated, reduce some of this preterm delivery by extending pregnancy safely because you know that the mother is at high risk, is at low risk. And what will it do? Obviously, all our clinicians here know if you were able to extend the pregnancy even, you know, a couple of weeks, this will have significant improvement in neonatal outcomes. So you can envision that this will require less admission to the NICU, less oxygen requirement and other complications of prematurity. Now, I do want to just, just one more point on this low-risk patients. So we also know that, especially in my patient population, among all patients who have hypertensive disorder at the University of Chicago, 80% of the patients are African-American, and they are at higher risk to have, for example, chronic hypertension. Also, a lot of these patients don't have prenatal care. So it's really a clinical conundrum 
to figure out if somebody just walks in at you know 28 weeks, whether this is all chronic hypertension, worsening chronic hypertension, or severe preeclampsia. In the PRACES study, this test had a very high negative predictive value, so over 97% in patients who had chronic hypertension. So I think it'll be really helpful as a rule out test to allow the pregnancy to prolong safely. Now, let me give you an example. I know because you say a lot of patients are here. So very recently, about a year ago, I had a patient who had renal transplant and she had chronic hypertension. So patients who have transplanted are at high risk to have preeclampsia and high risk to have kidney dysfunction. So she was on multiple medications for blood pressure control and for her graft rejection. At 28 weeks, she was admitted to the hospital because she had worsening hypertension and very elevated creatinine. She also had some LFTs that were elevated because cholestasis. So now if you look at the clinical criteria for preeclampsia by ACOG, she really met all the clinical criteria. She had elevated creatinine from her baseline. She had uh, LFTs. She had uncontrolled hypertension. But then I was um, under research at that time. I was able to get her soluble fit PLGF, and it is very, very low. So once I got that information, I was able to tell the patient that her risk for developing severe preeclampsia in the subsequent two weeks is very low. I actually discharged her from the hospital after we controlled her blood pressures, and we very closely managed her expectantly with blood pressure management. She had some renal dysfunction. Obviously, her kidney were not really functioning well. I was able to continue her pregnancy till 35 weeks. And then after that, she delivered. The baby had minimal stay in the NICU, and she also did very well. So I think those are the kind of scenarios that I can think as clinicians where you can technically use the test to prolong the pregnancy safely in women who have a negative test. So obviously, we don't have a treatment right now to to treat preeclampsia. So in the absence of that, we'll do that. Obviously, the big question is, I think I do want to point out is that we all know maternal mortality is going up in US and a lot of maternal mortality is related to preeclampsia and hypertensive disorders. So if you look at that, a lot of adverse outcomes in women are happening because of delay in diagnosis and delay in care. So I think that's where the positive test will help because then we can maybe up, step up care to the, uh, for patients who have a positive test. If they were in a community hospital, you can potentially transfer them to a tertiary hospital. Right. You can send them to a place where they're appropriate in acute level. And again, I think it's a very, it has a very high compared to other clinical tests available, positive predictive value to predict some of these adverse outcomes. So I think it's both ways. I think essentially it will help clinicians to identify women at high risk. And again, it goes along with the disparity uh, uh, question that women who are African-American high risk to have adverse outcomes. So I think it will help both ways. It will help us stratify women who are at high risk and appropriately treat them and use it as a warning sign for severe disease. And at the same time, if it's negative, perhaps expectantly managing her and prolonging her pregnancy to help the fetus. Excellent. Thank you. Um, I'm actually going to take us a step back. And Dr. Sandani, maybe you can take, take this question. The research that led to this test, and of course, as many of you all have noted, it's not just one study. There's been an accumulation of a lot of uh, research, but specifically the study that um, identified and, and evaluated its use here in the U.S., if you could talk a little bit about the, the findings of that study, and when we talk about a positive predictive value or negative, just interpret some of that research lingo for a lay population. What does that really mean? What did the research really show us as far as the utility of this test and the spe specificity of it? Um, and if you can also, in, in describing it, talk a little bit about the various U.S. populations that could be affected by preeclampsia, which is basically all of us, but does the test, did the test find any differences between different populations and were all populations adequately included in the research? What's getting at my question in part is we know we have a huge racial disparities issue here in this country. And specifically when you look at both the prevalence of preeclampsia as well as the outcomes from preeclampsia, we know that Black Americans, as an example, are disproportionately affected. So I'm wondering how all of that plays into the, the test, and, and excuse me, into the research. Sure, happy to, Eleni. Uh, so we embarked on this study uh, to address several key items. The first thing I will say is, of course, these kinds of studies take a team, an incredible team. And Dr. Rana, one of the lead investigators on this study, and Dr. Valoran as an advisor, uh, always. Uh, Dr. Sarah Kilpatrick, uh, Anand Karmanshi, and myself, when we put the study together, we were very intentional, Eleni, to making sure 
that whatever study we did in the United States, one, it had adequate and robust representation of women from different races and ethnicities, that we had a representation of different ages, that we had a representation from different regions of the United States, the East, the West, the South, the Midwest, and so forth. And importantly, we also included women in different kinds of hospitals, community hospitals, tertiary care hospitals. We wanted to do a large enough study so that we can look very carefully at all of these different variables to determine how robust these markers were going to be as a measure, if you will, to aid in the diagnosis and prognosis of, of these women. We did this study, um, interestingly enough, just before the pandemic began and successfully were able to carry it through the pandemic, which speaks to, I think, a number of the, the people uh, uh, participating in this study. We also, Eleni, we had a CRO, a, a very professional CRO icon that managed the study with us uh, at each of the sites. We enrolled women, hospitalized women, from 18 different sites. They all were singleton pregnancies. We excluded women who had multiple gestations because in multiple gestations, it modifies the levels, which we can talk about if there's time. Yes, these were women between 23 and 35 weeks of gestation, and they were admitted to these hospitals with hypertensive disorders of pregnancy by, as by defined by, by ACOG. What we were looking for was a blood test on admission or at enrollment specifically, and the prediction, and this is the primary endpoint, of whether or not that blood test could identify who went on to develop preeclampsia with severe features. Features that were so severe enough that they would warrant some kind of intervention um, or, or some kind of management. That was the primary endpoint. But as you also alluded to, and Dr. Rana and, and, and Professor Lauren alluded to, we were very interested in the prognosis. The prognosis in this case was, was this test not only linked to a woman getting severe preeclampsia or preeclampsia with severe features, but did it also predict maternal adverse outcomes, edema, seizures, abruption, DIC? Did this test predict adverse fetal outcomes, low birth weight, growth restriction, and, and, and neonatal death? And importantly for us, did this test identify or give us some clue as to when a woman was going to deliver? And I'll come back to that in a minute. We did a study that involved over a thousand women. So one of the largest in the United States. The average age was 31 years of age. And importantly, uh, uh, African-American women represented about 31% of all women in the study. So one of the largest studies that have included women uh, uh, from uh, uh, African-American backgrounds. And 16% of the women, Eleni, uh, uh, identified themselves as having a Hispanic uh, ethnicity. These women were at 30 weeks of gestation. And so we looked, the first endpoint was, did the blood test, the ratio, identify women to develop severe or preeclampsia with severe features. And what we noticed early on was the woman that went on to get preeclampsia with severe features had a level 30 times almost higher than women that didn't get severe features. When you looked at, um, uh, we did this in a validation and a derivation cohort, and I won't go into those details, but those are sort of the main numbers. That was the primary endpoint. Somebody asked on the chat the positive and negative predictive values. 65% positive predictive value 96% negative predictive value. And what does that mean? It means that if a test is negative with a negative predictive value of 96%, there's less than 5% chance that she's going to get the condition within two weeks. Now, I will emphasize something that everyone has alluded to. These were women all hospitalized. So these are hospitalized women only. It's only been tested in that population. We looked at the accuracy of this blood test compared to everything else we have blood pressure, liver function abnormalities, platelet counts, and so forth. And it turns out the accuracy of this ratio exceeds the other blood tests we use. But importantly, as Professor Valoran said, it doesn't replace those other blood tests. We do those routinely, and it's the aggregate of the information that is absolutely critical. There's a few other points I want to just highlight, and that is, while we know now the ratio identifies women who are going to get severe or preeclampsia with severe features, the results were pretty remarkable in terms of predicting adverse maternal outcomes, almost a 30, excuse me, almost a tenfold difference in levels in women who were going to get adverse maternal outcomes versus not. In other words, the, the test predicts what what's going to happen to the mother, but also the severity of the mother's illness. And in the same fashion, it predicts the severity of the fetal illness, meaning we were able to predict with very high levels, 
uh, fetal demise, as well as growth restriction. But the most interesting feature, and this is what happens when you have a large study, because you can actually tease these, these apart because you have a lot of patients, is that the higher the levels, the faster women delivered. Now, it's important to note that when we did this study, we didn't inform clinicians of the levels. We didn't tell them this was the level. So they didn't make any clinical decisions based on a knowledge of these levels. They simply did what they were doing clinically. And we asked, could these levels have identified and predicted this? And in fact, yes, the higher the levels, the faster uh, that, that uh, these women delivered. So the tests are not perfect, not at all. They have some false positives and false negatives. And that's why when the FDA came back, they said that these tests should be used as an aid in the risk assessment for progression to severe features, but also in the prognosis, because we were able to link the results of the test to the adverse outcomes for mother, baby, and also time to delivery. As you can imagine, and I'll end here, that this kind of robust data set with these kinds of outcomes also are very informative in terms of developing a treatment for which, as Professor Rana said, and, and Professor Valoran said, is our ultimate goal. So it provides the first step, if you will, to helping clinicians, aiding clinicians, but also setting the stage for the next few years, which we're obviously very excited about. Absolutely. And I'm, I'm going to ask, you know, several of you have alluded to or, or spoken directly to some of the very specific criteria that were in place as any research study has to have, right? You can't let, it, it, it won't tell you anything if you don't hold very specific, um, put specific guardrails in place for that study. That said, um, we're talking about one study and one particular um, company's test that has come through FDA clearance. All of you all are involved in and aware of the fact that there are many tests that are in the pipeline right now. Um, while this test has certain um, guidance about how you can or can't use it, I'm wondering if you can talk about it, maybe Dr. Rana, Dr. Sandani, you can talk about some of the other things going on here in the US, but Dr. Uh, Verlohan, maybe there's, again, if Europe is leading the way with some of the more innovative um, testing that's happening in preeclampsia, what is the state of more advanced, more sophisticated tests coming down the pipe? for preeclampsia, whether it be for prediction, maybe early prediction, um, or other ways of diagnosing when, when things are going wrong. Can we expect to see more of this kind of testing uh, coming through the pipeline? And, and I open that up to any of you all because I know you're all involved in a variety of different studies. So um, I would say there is no other candidate which is as far ahead of everything else than the S50 to PHF ratio. So, um, uh, you know, in, in medical research, often new candidates for biomarkers or for any tests that might predict anything pop up and there's one or two uh, good studies. And then uh, when the bigger studies come, they are off again because they did not live up to um, the potential they seem to have in smaller studies. This is definitely not the case about the S50 to PGF ratio. This is here to stay. And um, this is best um, elucidated that um, this test is in current clinical use um, since many years in Germany and Europe. And I must add two things. It is not only in clinical use, it is actually now part of the definition of preeclampsia. So uh, the German uh, guidelines were the first in 2019 who have um, included an, an altered angiogenic factor measurement result. So um, let's say an altered S to PGF ratio and one item of the definition of preeclampsia. So historically, and um, as uh, Professor Rana had said before, historically, the definition of preeclampsia was very simple. It was hypertension and proteinuria. And actually, ACOG were, were the first to relativize the role of proteinuria. And uh, in their um, change of definition back in 2013, um, preeclampsia was diagnosed by, could be diagnosed in absence of proteinuria if, in addition to hypertension, other features of end organ damage in the mother um, were um, um, seen. And um, the International Society for the Study of Hypertension and Pregnancy then, a little bit later in 2019, also included the fetal compartment. So in absence of proteinuria, the combination of hypertension and IOGR, for example, so a not well-grown baby also could represent um, what mean preeclampsia. Um, 
And we then in Germany in the same year have also added uh, the altered angiogenic factor uh, measurement results. So the combination of hypertension and an elevated S to PAGF ratio would mean in our setting that this is preeclampsia. So this is a very far advancement of these markers. And the maximum actually is if something is fully reimbursed by the healthcare system. And this is actually the case in Germany. So also since 2019, every pregnant woman with a high risk of preeclampsia will have three measurements in her pregnancy of the S to PAGF ratio fully covered uh, by her um, institutionary uh, health insurance. So this is just showing how deeply rooted uh, this um, ratio is. And I don't think that there are any new uh, tests from different um, pathophysiological pathways will be soon uh, coming any, anywhere close uh, to what the S to PGF ratio is here. But I might add what the future might hold is that um, um, digital tools and maybe um, techniques like machine learning might add to the predictive accuracy if um, the ratio result is not used as a standalone cutoff. So there's a cutoff and you're either below or beyond that cutoff and the risk is predicted according to that single test result. But integrating the s to PAGF ratio together with all the other clinical tools that we are measuring into multi-marker modeling using techniques like machine learning or standard regression statistics might add to uh, the predictive accuracy. And actually there's um, ongoing research um, on that field where Professor Arana and me are collaborating. So this is what I would say uh, is something that the future holds, but s to PGF so, will be a cornerstone of that. Okay, so let me let me quickly um, ask the other two to address uh, if you have an awareness of other other than the um, s to PLGF ratio, if you think that there are other biomarkers that might be in the pipeline and, and again, not not imminent or maybe they are. Um, so if you could just real quickly address if you think that this is a robust field or uh, is, is this it? Are, are we, you know, at, at the height of innovation at this point? Please go ahead, Sarosh. I just wanted to add that where we are in the U.S., Eleni, is personally from my point of vantage point of view. So currently it's only approved for one platform by the FDA. So I think for our new year future, I'm really hoping because different hospitals and people who work in hospitals know this, not all hospitals have that have that platform. Platform, when I mean platform, is like the company which is offering this test. So I think in an immediate future, hopefully other companies who have much larger, perhaps, you know, footprint in the lab space in United States hospitals, especially smaller community hospitals, I'm hoping they will have the test available to their patients. Um, personally, I also hope that the perhaps FDA can wider widen up their indication for future use. So for example, in Germany, um, and yeah, Stefan, you're right. So ISSHP actually even changed the definition in 2021. And I was part of one of those, you know, authors that we have included s one PLGF ratio as a definition of preeclampsia. That's, I think, far away from US right now. But I'm really hoping that perhaps they can, the next, next company, whosoever gets the biomarker approved, perhaps they can have a wider indication such as perhaps we can use this in patients who are suspected preeclampsia in other scenarios, like in an ET, where a lot of patients, especially women of color are seeking care in obstetrical triage and even among high-risk patients in clinical setting when we are seeing these patients in the clinic and we are just admitting them and repeating like blood tests 15 times on them. So I'm like, you are, I mean, not that I say that this is the cap of the highest of innovation, but I think there's just so much work to be done uh, we just got this approved, so we just have to get it to our patients, the right kind of patients, obviously, which is all patients. And then I'm really personally hoping that there'll be little widening of the indication of when we can use this. Well, I'm glad you mentioned that about the various platforms and other companies um, uh, trying to get their products across the FDA, because I think some of the questions as we're watching chat have to do with um, access to this test. And I think what we're hearing is that access to to this test or a test very much like this is really going to be dependent on getting all the different companies whose equipment is in the different hospital or other healthcare settings um, and get it as, as broadly um, disseminated as possible. I know we wanted to get this um, whole conversation wrapped up. Uh, Amy, you, mind if I just make, if you mind if I just make one quick comment? Please, yes, Great. go ahead. 
Um, look, this is the first test approved by the FDA. It's not going to be the last test approved by the FDA. And it's certainly not going to be uh, tests only in, in the space of PLGF and, and, and SFLIT. Uh, there are some really outstanding uh, investigators and work in the area of RNA sequencing, as people probably heard about earlier in the year or late last year. There's work on aptamer proteomics. Um, you know, we, we finally have a test. We need to celebrate it, but we can't stop here. We finally have a GPS that the FDA has shown us that this is a pathway that one can get approved um, and uh, understand at least now what the goalposts are. And that actually will, will excite and ignite a number of other areas and tests that are soon to come. There's also some really interesting urine tests we haven't talked about. So this is not the, the end by any stretch. It's sort of the beginning uh, on, many, on many different levels. Thank you. That was absolutely a very worthy uh, a comment. I think that's that's kind of at the root of what a, a lot of people are thinking. Um, so I want to. I realize that none of you all are representing ACOG officially, but it was interesting that um, Dr. Verlohan talked about the fact that the German uh, sort of governing body uh, included this in your guidelines, and it's actually part of the preeclampsia, the definition of preeclampsia. If you all could look into your crystal balls, what's it going to take for ACOG to actually incorporate a test like this um, or, or biomarkers in general like this into the U.S. guidelines? Uh, just a reminder, if you're watching, please mute yourself and use the chat feature to submit any questions or comments you have. Thoughts about ACOG incorporating this into actual guidelines? What do you think? I don't know, but I am part of the OB. Uh, ACAG just invited me to be part of their guideline committee in OB. Um, so I have to get there to ask them if they are even thinking of, um, I mean, the study that was done, it was published in a very highly reputable journal. And like you said, it's just not one study. There is so much data from all across the world. And ISSHP guidelines incorporated that um, besides the German guidelines. So that's ISSHP guidelines is followed by a lot of countries in the world, especially big countries like India, where they do have a large population. So um, I can't really speak on behalf of ACOG, but I don't know if Ravi has some comments. Um, yeah. So um, I will just say the following, you know, ACOG is a, a very esteemed and uh, organization and more importantly has some outstanding uh, people there. And Sarah Kilpatrick, by the way, who's uh, the senior author on this paper, um, uh, I think still is a, a member of, of those committees and that committee. Ultimately guidelines come about, as you know, Eleni, when there's ample real world data to support the research studies, as was alluded to the research studies, are very restrictive in terms of who they include and the ages and gestational ages and so forth. And, you know, as Thermo Fisher rolls out this assay, which I think is in the next few weeks, which we're excited about, we will start to gather real world data and clinicians will begin to use it. And it's the aggregate of the research data plus the real world data that ultimately then escalates to developing guidelines. So I think we'll begin, you know, we'll begin to see deliberations at least now, but my suspicion is some real world data will have to come out before true guidelines are finalized. But I maybe ask Professor Valoran how that went about in, in, in Europe. Yeah, so um, it, it was it was the building up of the evidence. So multiple um, studies have shown, um, consistently shown the use. And um, uh, in the German guidelines, we mention it in, um, in, in, in several aspects. We mention it as an additional use in prediction and in diagnosis. But we also have recognized, and that's very importantly, we have also recognized the, the deeply rootedness of this pathway in the pathophysiology of the disease. So it was a logical step to um, also include it next to the other um, pathophysiological features of the disease in the definition and, and thus um, it has been done. Excellent. Well, um, we certainly have our work cut out for us. Um, as we, we wrap up this interesting conversation, and I know I for one could probably go on for another hour. This has been, this has really been the uh, a key um, a key initiative for the Preeclampsia Foundation for well over a decade. Um, we've supported We've listened to our community who is desperate for better ways to predict and diagnose preeclampsia. We have uh, 
thousands and thousands of stories um, of women and, and their families who could have been helped by a test like this. For any of our speakers, I guess the last question I'm gonna ask us to kind of close with is um, how can patients as individuals or an organization like ours help to support the continued advancement of tests like this? And, uh, and I'll ask any of you all to throw in your two cents worth. Again, how we as an organization can continue to support this, but also we've got you know, 100 people on this call and 200 more that have registered that are gonna listen to it later. If they wanna engage in this process, what do you recommend? I can start, uh, Eleni, if, if you wish, and then hand it over to the, the, my esteemed colleagues. You know, Eleni, we would not be here today were it not for, as I said, pushing and your push and your perseverance. Um, but we also would not be here today were it not for the fact that we had over a thousand women participating in this study. Um, women that took a chance, women that decided to participate and advance this field that may not, by the way, have helped them directly, but to help women to come. And participating in research, as you can see, and especially the level of innovation that goes on in the United States and in Europe, we're absolutely blessed to be able to offer that. But those women that decided to participate are the ones we need to celebrate here. And if you ask me, we obviously want all women to have healthy pregnancies. We hope this test helps women all around the world. But we would not be here today were it not for the fact that those women who decided to participate in these studies decided to participate. And as we advance this field, we have to do it as by way of partners, right? Patients are our partners and we are partners with them and we could not be more thankful for that. Maybe I can briefly continue. So um, it is it is it's very crucial that physicians um, get their hands on the test and have an, an, an experience, a practical experience managing patients with it next to the um, huge body of evidence, obviously, of the published data. But then it is also uh, what patients can do if they ask for this test, then maybe they will alert their local physicians and the local physicians will inform themselves and will also maybe um, um, aim for including it in their daily practice. So I think the patients can ask for it. And obviously, the word has been spread. So thank you uh, to you, Eleni, to do a very important step here in spreading the word that the more physicians know about this test and the more physicians know how to use it and how they can implement it in their daily routine, and the more patients ask for it, the more will benefit from it. And Dr. Rana, you get to close us out. <laughs> No, I was just thinking uh, very appropriate what uh, what you know Ravi and Stefan were saying. But yeah, I would agree. I think at least what I can foresee here in the US is I think, yeah, right, like education for the providers. I mean, I think it can't be like a little black box of biomarkers. I think we should, you know, hopefully have access to it. Their own little way. But I'm hoping that people can have, doctors can have access to it. And I do agree there's a large part I'm hoping the your organization and other patients will continue to play, especially for, you know, we, like Ravi was saying, we all want healthy pregnancies, but not all pregnancies are healthy. I see a lot of patients who have prior preeclampsia, so that's a conundrum for them. They definitely want tests that can, you know, maybe help them better this time. So I think, yeah, definitely educating the patients, educating the, you know, and at some point are, you know, people who make the decisions of how do these things get reimbursed, who decides to have the machine in the in the hospitals and how does that get reimbursed? So I think some of these finances have to be worked out. But in the short term, I think just educating people and having forums like this when people can ask questions about what exactly is the test and how they can use it and eventually using it ourselves. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, we're gonna close out. I really appreciate all three of you spending time with us today. And I think the uh, 300, actually over 300 people that registered for this webinar. This is obviously a key topic with patients and their families and people thinking about getting pregnant. So we, we we're just incredibly um, grateful for your time, not just today, but on your commitment to making preeclampsia a, a, a thing of the past, something that no longer is going to be life-threatening to moms and to babies.
Uh, for all of you watching, we thank you for joining us today. This has been another edition of Beyond the Headlines, and this will be available for later playback. We thank you for joining us. Uh, hopefully you found additional information in the chat. We'll be doing some follow-up activity. And of course, as always, visit us at preeclampsia.org on the web or on any of our social media channels. Thanks, everybody. Have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.